this whole lecture. So first, we always have to go through the anatomy okay, of the musculoskeletal system. So um, you have bones, joints, or ligaments, tendons, and muscles. It is to help support okay, this to stand erect for movement, protect our inner vital organs, produce red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, especially in the bone marrow. It's a reservoir for storage of essential minerals, <clears throat> such as calcium and phosphorus in the bones. So the structure and function, so our, our body is made of, of hundreds of bones. It's our skeleton, it's that bony framework. Bone and cartilage are specialized forms of connected tissue. So our bones are hard, rigid, and very dense. Now there's different types of bones. You have flat, irregular, you have short, long bones, and then sesamoid bones, okay, like your patella. Your long bones, okay, like your femur or your humerus, those are long bones. Um, those are high risk for breaks. And then when they do break, they can actually uh, put off like a fat emboli, which we'll talk about a little bit. Okay, so our joints. So we have fibrous, cartilage, uh, uh, synovial. Okay, so they're going to be like a union of two or more bones so there's the fibers which is an immovable such as the sutures in our skull um now slightly movable joints okay such as like the ribs and sternum especially when we are inhaling exhaling synovial we talked about this in class synovial joints so those move freely okay they have fluid in the middle and it's to help move Okay, to have a smooth movement between the bones. They have a tough, firm consistency, but yet they're very flexible. So types of joints that are movable, okay, think of those. So your shoulder, your elbow, your wrist, your knee, your ankle. Synovial, okay, though, <clears throat> has that hinge, the flexion extension. Um, again, the elbow, the knee, um, the ball and socket, okay, of the foot, or not the foot, I'm sorry, of the hip, okay, that could be flexion, extension, rotation, adduction, uh, abduction, circumduction, and internal external rotation. Um, so that's like the hip and the shoulder. Um, condyloid. Okay, so flexion, extension, hyperextension. That could be the wrist or the neck. Okay, so a little bit more about the synovial joints. Um, now keep in mind, this is a very long, long PowerPoint. I will not be discussing every single thing in this PowerPoint. I will post this, okay? And you're welcome to pause it. So you can read the slides, but there's some things that I'm not going to go over because it's very basic knowledge that you've had in AMP before. So to go back to the lecture, so there's ligaments, okay, they're strong, flexible bands of connective tissue. Uh, they strengthen joints and help prevent or yeah, prevent movement in undesirable directions. Our tendons, they connect muscles to bones and they allow movement. Now we have bursas. Okay, sometimes we have a bursa, so it's an enclosed sac filled with synovial fluid. Okay, they help muscles and tendons glide smoothly over bone. Um, so, such as like the shoulder or the knee, there's bursas there. So, it's just an example for you guys to look at the synovial joint, and you can see within that. Okay, so our muscles. So, the function, so when they contract, they produce movement. So movement of extremities in the range of motion of joints. So there's three different types, there's skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. Skeletal, okay, keep in mind, skeletal is attached to the bone through tendons. 
to move, line the organs of the body, and cardiac makes up the heart. So lungs, smooth muscle. Skeletal or voluntary muscles are under conscious control. So it's uh, more of a, like, they're stimulated by an electrochemical impulse, so a neurotransmitter between the nerve ending and the muscle, and then that's going to be resulting in that movement. Okay, so the head and neck. Let's see. So the TMJ, okay, so it's where the mandible and the temporal bone meet. You can feel it when depression anterior to the tragus of the ear. So <clears throat> when you're doing the trigeminal nerve assessment, okay, cranial nerve five, when you're having them clench their teeth and then open up, you're making sure that you can feel that TMJ joint, okay, the temporal mandibular joint, and can you feel it opening and closing? So this permits jaw function of speaking and chewing. Um, it allows three different motions. So hinges action to open and close the jaw, the gliding action of protrusion and retraction. Um, the side to side movement of the lower jaw. Okay, so the spine landmark. So back to anatomy, so you have cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and then sacrum. Um, so just if you need to do a rundown, just familiarize with this, with yourself with this slide so you understand how many vertebrae are in each area. Um, so we've talked about this numerous times about that normal curvature. So we're going to have that lumbar curve, okay, and then there's that cervical curve and thoracic curve. Um, so it's the spine really, it's together. It allows the spine to absorb shock well. So the distribution of weight to the pelvis and the lower extremity. So it really does help that those curves to absorb shock when it, um, when it does occur. So abnormal curvatures, this is what we talked about a lot. So kyphosis, it's commonly in our elderly, okay? Um, excessive curvature of the thoracic spine, so they have that kind of like hunchback. Um, remember in class, I had you guys all like put your like sit up straight. I was like, you just went from kyphosis because you're all hunched over on your computers, and then you went to a normal curvature. You strength, you stretched out your back. So then there's lordosis, so pregnancy or toddlers. Okay, so that curvature, excessive curvature in the lower in the lumbar, so LL, lordosis, lumbar. Scoliosis, so that's a lateral curvature, okay? And that's more of a C or an S shape. Okay, so our shoulder, our shoulder has the greatest range of motion out of everything else. <clears throat> our shoulder has the greatest range of motion. So some palpable landmarks so to guide for our examination is the scapula and the clavicle. They help kind of form the entire shoulder. You can feel the bump of the scapula as a chromium process at the very top of the shoulder. So that chromium process is actually going to be that risk for a bony prominence. Okay. Elbow. So our elbow, so it has three different bony articulations, the humerus, the radius, and the ulna of the forearm. So the hinge action moves the forearm, so the radius and ulna, in one plane, allowing flexion and extension. Okay, so the radius and the ulna articulate with each other. Okay, so they go together. They're one at the elbow and one at the wrist, so they permit pronation and supination of the hand and forearm. So our wrist and carpals, so they allow for those fine motor skills. It's very important that we have these. We need to perform those fine motor skills. So you have the metacarpals there. You have the radial carpal. Um, so the flexor tendons of the wrist and hand 
enclosed in synovial sheets. All right, so more of the wrist. You have those carpal muscles, so they allow for flexion of the wrist. The radial and ulnar muscles, they allow for extension of the wrist. Muscles in the forearm, they allow supination and pronation. The muscles in the thumb they allow flexion, extension, abduction, and opposition. So the muscles in the fingers and tendons and muscles in the forearm and wrist, they're going to allow for flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction of the fingers. So for the wrist, um, you have the median nerve. So the median nerve is going to be right down in the middle. So it often is associated with carpal tunnel disorder. So if someone's saying, I have a lot of numbness, tingling, a lot of discomfort in the arm, maybe it goes all the way up, maybe it's more positional, they have a fear of possible carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, so what's another test you can have them do to see if they do have carpal tunnel? Good, the Fallon's test. That's when you're gonna take the dorsal of your hands, put them together, and you're gonna squeeze them together and you're gonna hold it there. And there should be no pain, but if there is pain, it could be an indicator for carpal tunnel disorder. So the hip, so our hips, it has the ilium, the head of the femur, the greater trochanter, the pubis and the, um, the femur body itself. So the ball and socket action, it permits the wide range of motion on many axes. So we talked about how far the, it could go. So less range of motion than the shoulder, but more stability for weight bearing function. So it is so strong, okay, that ball and socket, it is so strong for us to stand on it constantly rather than our shoulder, but our shoulder still has the greatest range of motion. Okay, so a little bit more about the hip. Um, this is more just about anatomy. We won't go through this, but you are welcome to read through this. The knee. So the knee is the largest joint in the body, it has a hinge joint, so it is a hinge joint. So it only permits the flexion extension of the lower leg on a single plane with the quadriceps and the hamstring muscles. Um, the synovial membrane is the largest in the body, okay? Your meniscus and ligaments provide support for the knee. All right, so the ankle and the foot, okay? So it has a articulation of the tibia the fibula and the talus. So the hinge joint, okay, it's limited to flexion, dorsiflexion and extension, plantar flexion in one plane. So the landmarks, okay, there's two bony prominences on either side, the medial malus and the lateral. So it may be torn in eversion or inversion sprains of the ankle. So when you have an ankle sprain, these are the locations. Um, the joints distal to the ankle give an additional mobility to the foot. So with our aging adults, um, bone remodeling, it starts doing this around age 40. So the resorption occurs more rapidly than dep uh, deposition. Um, so the loss of bone and bone density has a greater risk of osteoporosis. Um, it's definitely greater in women because of the menopause and there's lack of estrogen due to the bone loss. Uh, postural changes are evident in aging as well. So you see that curvature, the kyphosis. And then also remember we talked about an abdomen that they have that distribution of subcutaneous fat from the arms and the face and it goes to the abdomen. So again, the fat is redistributes to the abdominal area from the arms and face. Uh, loss of subcutaneous fat leaves those bony prominences more marked. 
Um, absolute loss in muscle mass occurs, so some decrease in size, and then there's some atrophy. So where the atrophy causes weakness. So that range of motion exercises is so imperative for them so they don't get atrophy and they don't get that weakness or as much weakness. Um, the contour of muscles become more prominent and the muscles and tendons will feel more distinct. Uh, their lifestyle, it definitely affects uh, musculoskeletal changes. Now with all these, things that are gonna to happen to us, what are you gonna do, okay? What are you gonna do about this? Educate your client to exercise, weight-bearing exercises such as walking, at least 20 to 30 minutes a day. It's gonna help prevent osteoporosis, increase their muscle strength, increase balance, and also it's gonna help decrease fall risk and fractures because they're having that muscle strength and balance that's increased. <clears throat> so some questions that we can ask, and I'm just going to go through some briefly because I'm going to have you guys look through this, is I want to know initially, like just by looking at them, I can see if they have kyphosis, but I'm going to ask them, like, do you have any pain? Now, if they have any pain, do they have any other symptoms with this pain? Um, do they have any neuromuscular disorders, any tremors and ability to control movements? Um, do they have any neurological disorders, such as have they had seizures, strokes, any head injuries? Have they had a loss of function or weakness with a joint or any muscles? And how does it impact their ADLs? Their dirt and how long? So if it impacts their ADLs, okay, um, does it impact their bathing? Do they have a problem with their balance and coordination? How about their toileting? Are they able to dress themselves? Grooming, are they able to complete their grooming independently? Do they prepare their own meals? Do they bring, um, do they cut up their own food? Are they able to drink alone? Can they walk? How's their mobility? Do they walk with any assisted devices? Um, communicating, can they talk? Can they use a telephone? Um, are they able to dial the number or, do they have to have someone dial it for them? And can they still write? Um, I want to know if they have any occupational hazards. So anything that's repetitive, anything that's going to have chronic stress to the joints. Um, do they have a problem uh, performing these tasks? Does anything alleviate, alleviate them? Do they do an exercise program? What do they do? Do they warm up? Do they stretch? Have they, have it, have they had any recent weight gain? Okay, or weight loss. Um, describe their diet. What type of medicines are they taking? If they have a chronic or crippling disease, um, how is that illness affecting them? And how is it affecting their families? Okay, so joints. So when you're asking for any joint pain, we're literally just going to do PQRST. What provokes it? What's the quality? Where is it? Which joint? Is it both joints or is it just one? Severity, what's the pain level? Timing, when did it start? What time of the day? How long does it last? How often does it occur? And is it associated with any other symptoms? Fever, chills, sore throat, trauma, repetitive activity. Um, some more questions. Okay, I'm gonna let you guys read through these. And these. Okay, so additional history questions for our age and adults, because we are going to do a functional assessment. We have to see how are they functioning at home? Are they able to take care of themselves or do they need assistance? Um, have they had any change in weakness over the past few months? Have they had any increase in falls or stumbling in the past months? Do they use any aids and do they actually use them? So when we're preparing for the exam, we're going to, just like every exam, we're going to explain the purpose of the exam. And then we're going to um, gather all our data from the health history. And then when we're looking at the patient, we're going to see how their gait is. How is their posture? Are they sitting comfortably? And make sure you are asking the patient every time you're about to touch and be like, is it okay if I touch you? 
is if they have a cultural problem with touching, you need to establish that communication prior to starting the actual physical exam. So always make your person, your patient, very comfortable before and throughout the entire exam. So if they're in a gown, you need to go joint to joint, then just expose the joint you need. So take an orderly approach. So always go from head to toe, okay? Proximal to distal and midline outward, okay? So compare the comp uh, corresponding pair of joints. So if you're looking at the left wrist, you better start looking at the right wrist and making sure that they look the same. Because if one is inflamed, okay, then that's an unexpected finding. Um, make sure that when you're looking at um, any area that is inflamed, be very careful. Don't cause your patient pain. Don't make sure you explain, be like, okay, can you show me how far you can move it? Because we do need to know how much range of motion they have, but try not to um, have a rough manipulation that's going to cause pain or any spasms. So the first thing we're going to do is inspection. We always inspect. We're looking for size, symmetry, is it alignment correctly, range of motion, any presence of deformities, inflammation. We're looking at their gait, their balance, how's their, uh, um, their like, are they symmetric at all when they're walking? And then the next thing we do is palpation. Okay, so the only assessment techniques that we do here is inspection and palpation. So with palpation, you're gonna palpate those deformities. Okay, if it's an obvious deformity, okay, perfect. But while you're palpating the arms, you may notice that there is a little deformity. Um, and you're gonna determine that size. Uh, palpate for any warmth, tenderness, muscle tone, any crepitus. So an unexpected, so unexpected could be a contracture. So there's a limited range of motion. So it could be just because of disuse, could be atrophy, there's muscle wasting, um, shortening of muscles due to an injury or a neurological damage. Okay, so when we're asking about their mus their range of motion. I'm gonna be asking those specific questions about, okay, are you able to move your arm all the way up? Can you bring it down? I wanna see how far is their range of motion because maybe they can only go to here and they're like, how? And then I'm gonna ask them, where does it hurt? So I wanna see the muscle tone and the strength as well. So this is when you're gonna be having them squeeze your fingers, push and pulls, okay? Push and pull at each joint. We want to see how strong they are. Um, so requiring assistance is prompt, so that's passive range of motion. Now, if they're able to support themselves, that's active range of motion. So cup your hands over the joints during the range of motion so you can feel for any crepitus. Now, I'll tell you, if you did that to my right knee, sometimes it does a little pop. That's crepitus. Um, but it doesn't do it all the time but it should be smooth and full range of motion. Um, unexpected range of motion could be due to a joint deformity, variations of range of motion from right to left, pain, hesitancy, crepitus, or muscle spasm. Okay, so we're doing this in class, okay? So you, I would still have you guys look at this, okay, at home. Teach a loved one, teach a family member, okay? Teach them like you're the, you're the nurse, they're the patient. Okay, so skeletal muscles. So flexion, flexion is bending, okay? I'm flexing at a joint. Dorsal flexion, so toes to shin. So dorsal, so I'm taking the dorsal side of the foot and I'm flexing it towards the shin. Plant our flexion, so the foot is going downwards. So that's pointing the toes. Extension, you can do this with your leg. Straightening the limb at the joint. Abduction, okay, is moving away. So you know those workout machines for the thighs? So you have abduction, and like, I used to do them all the time. Okay, so before we did the whole corona. But um, 
ab, ABD is away from the midline. So when you're using those machines, here's your thighs, and then you're moving it away, okay, from the midline. Adduction is when you're adding it to the midline. So you're moving it towards the midline. Um, pronation is turning the forearm so the palm is down. Pro, palm down. Soup nation. Okay. Like, can I have some soup? Palms are up. Circumduction. Moving the arm in a circle around, around the shoulder. Okay. Circumduction. Um, so some other ones is inversion. So tilting the sole of the foot to inward, inward at the ankle. Eversion, tilting the foot outward at the ankle. Rotation, moving the head around the central axis. Internal rotation, so rotate the joint inward. External rotation, rotate the joint outward. Protraction, moving the body part forward, parallel to the ground. Okay, if I put my head out, protraction. And then bring retraction and retracting it. Okay, moving the body part backwards. Elevation, rise the body part. Depression, lower it. Here's a, just a simple picture you guys can look at. So flexion extension, okay, so that deals with the neck, shoulder, elbow, wrist, fingers, thumb, hip, knees. Those all can do flexion extension. So what can do hyperextension is our neck, our shoulder, wrist, fingers, dorsal flexion and the plantar flexion is the ankle, lateral flexion is the neck, okay. Abduction and abduction, shoulders, wrists, fingers, thumbs, hips, toes. So opposition is thumb to fingers, okay. Pronation and supination, so the limb or joints is going to be the forearm. Circumduction is going to be the shoulders and hip. Um, inversion or eversion is going to be the feet. Rotation, the neck, shoulders, wrist, thumbs, hips. Retraction and protraction is the jaw. So these are just the joints and the range of motion. On specifically, we're just breaking these um, range of motion down to the specific joints. Okay, so my favorite, muscle testing. You are going to do so much muscle testing in your career that you're going to perfect it. Okay, so <clears throat> again, this is when you are just assessing each joint, okay, and you're seeing how strong your patient is. Now, some people might be stronger on one side than another. You have to figure out why. Why are you not strong in the left versus the right? Okay, you have to ask those questions. How, have you had an injury in that arm? Have you had a stroke? Have you had arthritis? Like, you have to ask them, what, why are they weaker in that left, that left arm? Now, how do you know how to scale them? So there's a scale from zero to five. So five, okay, and this is all objective. This is all objective. So if you came and assessed me, okay, and let's say one person assessed me and then another did as well. One person thinks I'm a five on my right, a three on my left. Maybe I had a stroke. Another person comes in. They go, no, she's a five and five, but she feels the same. That's fine, okay? But there's a huge difference. I mean, maybe there was pain too. But if you find your patient is maybe a five and a four, okay? A five is full range of motion against gravity with full resistance. A four is full range of motion against gravity with some resistance. Three is just full range of motion with gravity. Two, full range of motion with gravity but it's passive, okay? Uh, one is just a slight contraction, like a little <laughs> Zero is there's flaccid, no contraction. The expected is three or higher. But again, 
if you get your assessment and you get a five and a four, then you document that five and four. Because then the next time you go in, you're not comparing your assessment from someone else's. You're comparing it from your last assessment. It is important to look at their assessment to see what the trend is, especially if this is your first time, but make sure you continue to document what your objective finding is. So unexpected, okay, is less than a three, okay? Um, it could be due to discomfort or it could be there's, um, could be like they have arthritis. Now unexpected as well, if it's unequal on both sides, they should be equal. If they are not equal, you have to find out why. Investigate more. So head and neck, um, we're going to inspect. So again, kind of similar to what we talked about in H E N T. So I'm not going to go too great, too much into this. Um, but you're expected, so it should have symmetrical movement of the face, easy opening and closing of the jaw. Um, expected variations for older adults is kyphosis. Unexpected is any asymmetry in the muscles. Okay, so I'm going to let you guys read through this. All right, so I want to talk about this picture. This picture is important. Look at the difference. This guy is a lot thinner than him. What is this called? Atrophy. Absolutely. When you're looking at the limbs, you're inspecting first. You're to see, are they equal on both sides? Is there swelling? Is there irritation? Um, is there, uh, how's the color? So the color here is fine, but the size is asymmetric. So I would say, at, at your, well, I would just describe this um, in my documentation. And also, you can just measure it at the calf. Just measure at the calf and that can be your documentation. Uh, range of motion. So range of motion, normally there's no tenderness or pain or any crepitus. So don't confuse crepitus with a normal discrete crack, okay? But it has to be kind of a continuous crepitus. Um, sometimes that crack sound is more of just a tendon or a ligament that slips over the bone during the motion. So to talk about the cervical spine, we really want to make sure the spine is straight and the head is erect. So you can palpate um, and feel C7. It's connecting it's that little hump right here. So the person normally can maintain flexion against resistance, okay? So as in, what do I mean by that? Is you'll have your hand here, okay? That's the spinal nerve. So it's cranial nerve 11. So cranial nerve 11 is testing their shoulder strength and their head rotation. So you can put your hand right here on their side. You can do it on the dorsal, whatever you wish. And then just have them push against your hand with resistance. It should feel the same on both sides. Carpal tunneling, carpal tunneling, carpal tunnel testing. Okay, so we talked about the Fallon's test. So this is where you're going to have them hold their hands, the back to back, dorsal, dorsal, while flexing the wrist 90 degrees. They're going to hold this hopefully for 60 seconds and have no symptoms. If at all they start having numbness or burning or any pain, it's associated with carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, so sometimes you'll have to measure the length, okay, for any discrepancy, especially if they're having lower back pain or any hip pain. Um, so if you need to determine if one leg is shorter than the other, then you'll have to measure. So you're going to measure from the anterior iliac spine to the medial malleus, okay? So right in the middle, okay? See where he's at? Kind of like right, right in the medial side of the knee. So normally, okay, it'll be equal or about within like a one centimeter difference, um, but there should not be anything more than that. So just to briefly talk over again about our older adults. So they have that postural, postural change. They have decrease in height, more apparent in their 80s to 90s. Kyphosis is common. Their contour changes, so they have more abdominal fat. 
Bony prominences are more marked, okay? So because of the loss of fat and muscle mass, they have decreased range of motion and decreased bone mass, and they have a high risk of osteoporosis. So then you have to think of interventions you have to do for these. So <clears throat> these are all problems, right? Now, what can I do to assist these problems? Decrease range of motion. Maybe they need to do passive range of motion three or four times a day of exercise. Okay, decrease bone mass, so they have a risk of osteoporosis. So what type of nutrients do they need to increase in their diet? They need calcium. Okay, they need, what else? Phosphorus, perfect. And then think about what type of food is that? Okay, so functional assessment is so imperative that you guys do a thorough functional assessment. If you know an older adult, I challenge you to do a functional assessment. Go back to the slide where you're asking those questions and just interview them. Just do a basic interview on them. Okay, so some abnormalities affecting multiple joints. So there's inflammatory conditions, so such as rheumatoid arthritis, that's a big common one. A degenerative condition is osteoarthritis, so that's degenerative joint disease, or osteoporosis. So here's a question, just from your knowledge, what do you know? The nurse is assessing a patient's risk of developing osteoporosis which patient is considered at high risk for osteoporosis? A 65 year old man being treated for hypertension. Is he at risk for osteoporosis? A 55 year old woman who has had right knee surgery, okay? A 30 year old woman who smokes and is taking oral contraceptives. A 25 year old man who plays numerous college sports. What do you think? Okay, so the correct answer is actually number two. Postmenopausal women are at the highest risk. Okay, keep in mind, postmenopausal women are at the highest risk for developing osteoporosis. Osteoporosis, we know this, loss of bone density, huge risk factors is menopause, smaller height and weight, lack of physical activity lack of estrogen. So education you could do for your patient is no smoking, limit their alcohol, do weight bearing exercises, so just go just for a walk, calcium, vitamin D, phosphorus, okay, keep in mind calcium and vitamin D, they're best friends. So if you got a low calcium, you most likely have a low D. Just a summary on musculoskeletal exams. Again, you're inspecting, then you're palpating. You're assessing their range of motion. You're doing a functional assessment. You're testing their muscles out, okay? You're seeing how strong they are. Okay, so make sure you guys are following along with this PowerPoint and follow along with your chapters in your ATI Fundamentals book. Chapter, I just closed it. Which chapter are you? Chapter 31 on page 169. This is neuromuscular, so it has neurological and has musculoskeletal. Read through this. Read it. Okay, at the very end, there's questions. On page 173, there's five questions. Make sure you do those five questions. Um, they're very good questions. Look through your F.A. Davis book as well. Just work yourself through it and make sure you guys are doing assessments every single day. Just basic assessments, okay? Just work through all the systems that we have done and do those assessments. At any time, if you have any questions, just email me and I'll be available.